Welcome, I'm Catherine Bessness, CEO and founder of MD Financial. And today we have a very special Back by Popular Demand program just for our clients. It's home-based side gigs that you can do during COVID. I'm so happy to have Josh Lance with me. Josh is our Chief Investment Officer of Wealth of Knowledge. And thanks for joining us today, Josh. Absolutely, good evening. And our amazing engineer is Alyssa. We could not run this business without Alyssa. She makes us look fantastic and she keeps a whole company holding up and moving together. So thanks Alyssa for helping us out. Anytime. Awesome. So let's get, let's get started. This is a class that we did uh, earlier in the summer and we had so many clients that were really concerned about this issue, side gigs, that we decided we would offer it up once again. In fact, Josh, I think if, when it comes to think about it, maybe as many as 80% of our clients at one time or another have been thinking about side gigs. What would you say? Yeah, I think that's accurate. It's just more and more popular these days. And for a lot of reasons, which we're gonna be talking about. So let's talk a little bit about our agenda and a couple of housekeeping items. So we're gonna be talking about different options you can consider for side gigs how to get started, some of the tax advantages, some of the deductions, and a lot more. So this is very, very content rich, but we wanted to do this live, so we're here to answer questions. So yes, we'll be stopping periodically to be able to take questions. So right now, we have all of our participants on mute, and the, your videos are turned off for privacy. Now, in order to submit questions, we ask you not to use the Q&A function with Zoom, but instead to use the chat box and they will go to Alyssa and periodically will stop and answer those questions. Now, I would say that this is probably gonna take 60 minutes, maybe as many as 75 if you've got a lot of questions and we'll just stay and answer those questions as long as you have them. So let's get started. So our mission, whether we're talking about side gigs or any of the other things we do at MD Financial Advisors is this, when you take charge of your finances, you can transform your life. And one of the ways that you can consider taking charge of your finances is to consider a side gig. So the first thing I'd like to do is to do a poll and find out why would you like to do a side gig? So here's some of your options and Alyssa's gonna put up the poll. And the one issue may be paying down debt. By the way, you can answer more than one. Isn't that right, Alyssa? That is correct, yes. Yeah, so check as many as apply to you. A uh, second thing might be saving for your children's education. A third might be saving for retirement. Um, you might be replacing lost income for living expenses because a lot of our clients have lost income due to COVID and maybe you're feeling the pinch. Some of you are just bored or maybe you're seeking fulfillment or we have a fair number of clients who are actually very burnt out. That could be another option. And of course, there's always the other, whether you, maybe you're saving for your children's wedding, your own wedding, or a fancy car. So we'll just take a second here and have Alyssa be able to, um, to tabulate those results for us. And Alyssa, are, are you ready? Yep. Okay, what did you find out? So let's see, you should be able to see it now. Awesome, so it looks like we have 67% that are concerned about paying down debt, 67% that want to save for retirement, 33% on these replacing lost income, you're bored or seeking fulfillment, burnt out, or other. Maybe it's just a vacation. So all of those are really good reasons to consider side gigs. So let's take a look at what we're gonna be talking about when it comes to taking charge of your finances and transforming your life. So we're first gonna look at your spending. We're gonna talk about that in more detail. We're gonna talk about options for side gigs, how to get started, and then the fun part, what to do with the funds. So those are all things we're going to cover today. Now, the reason I want to take a look at spending is because very often we find our clients don't have a good handle on where their money is going. What, what do you think, Josh? What have you noticed? Well, you know, everyone has some idea of where their money is, but really the question is, do you have full control and, and, and a full idea of where it's going? And I would say 80% or more don't know the answer to where is all the money going. And that's a concern because we want to make sure that we can, every dollar is doing exactly what we want it to do. And it's not getting, 
it's not getting frittered away. So let's just take this case study. So let's take Dr. R working in LA and she makes about 314,000 annually. That's her gross income. And after tax, I'd call it about 17,000 a month after tax. And she's currently investing about 1500 a month towards her future. Now, this is not at all unusual. This is a hypothetical case, of course, but it's very similar to many, many cases we have. We're one of the few firms I know that literally sit down with clients and go through a budget line by line so that clients have a much better idea where their money is going. And when we look at her current spending, and she was kind of surprised with us too, hypothetically, of course, is that her income after tax is about 17,000. She's spending about 9,200 a month on personal family expenses, 900 on insurance, housing about 5,000, auto about 800, and she's saving about 1,500 a month. What this does though for Dr. R, she's actually in the hole every month about $400, hence the red. So one of the things about, about me is I don't like to do budgets with clients and do naughty, naughty, naughty. I, it, it, who wants to be blamed for how you're spending money? And I don't ever want to put my values on somebody else. I want to make sure that we're helping whatever our doctors, our clients' values are and helping them realize those values. So when we go through a budget, we'll typically look at the items and then I'll ask the client to go, well, you know, what do you see here? And all, almost always the doctors can connect the dots themselves on areas that they are overspending. And my hypothetical case here, of course, we've got the same income, but what we found, and this is not at all unusual, that she could actually get her personal living expenses down to about 5,000 a month or saving a difference of about 4,200. If she kept her insurance, housing, and auto expenses the same, she could actually increase her investments by 3,800 up to a total of 5,300 per month. So in the new budget, she can actually save 3,800 per month. And she can put this towards retirement. So now we've got a handle on her budget. Now, the reason I wanna stop here is occasionally, Josh, I'm finding that sometimes just going through this, this simple exercise with clients is all they need. They don't actually have to do, go to get a side gig, because sometimes we can just find lost money in their budget. What are you, are you seeing that too? I'm seeing that too. And the other thing that we're seeing is just with COVID-19, a lot of people are not traveling. They're not doing the, you know, dining out or social life that was there before. And so this has kind of naturally occurred and they're, they're realizing, hey, my expenses don't need to be so high. They might not have even valued those things as much as they thought they did. And now they have a bunch of extra money, which has solved part of the issue. Totally agree. It's not unusual for me to have a client who just couldn't save before because their expenses were like right at their income level. And to your point, after COVID, they find an extra $8,000. They're not traveling, you're right. They're not eating out. They're not buying a lot of new clothes, actually. So let's take it to step two, though, and say Dr. R wants to do a side gig. In this situation, we hypothetically had to have her do a side gig that she can gross $100,000 a year. Now, I know some folks in the audience are going to be going, oh my gosh, that seems like a lot. Not necessarily. We have numerous clients that are making $100,000 a year in side gigs. So in this, after tax, it's really maybe 65,000 or on a monthly basis after tax, that comes to about 5,500 per month. So what we wanted to do was here our, under our new budget, she's got an extra 22,500 or 5,500 extra per month. And considering we left the savings from last time, I'm sorry, we kept the personal expenses right where they were last time. We didn't make any changes at all in the insurance housing but we added a lot more to the savings account. Now we've got it up to 10,300 for investing. And guess what? We gave her another 500 just for fun money so she can take more trips or do something fun with that money. So the question is, what is that, that additional 8,800 or for a total of 10,300 invested? What does that do over time? So as I said, to summarize, She's making 5,500 more per month. She gets 500 more fun dollars in fund money and 8,800 more for retirement. So it can make a big difference over time. Now, if you are one of our current 
clients, we've probably done a budget for you in the past. And if you'd like us to resend that to you, please let us know. And then we can revisit that with you at our next meeting. If you're not a current client, once again, please let us know. I'll be more than happy to share our template with you. And you can either work on it yourself or we'd be happy to help you with it. Um, you can always email it, anything to us at info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. Now, questions. So, Alyssa, do we have any questions yet? Not yet. Okay. That sounds good to know. So let's talk about options for side gigs. So this slide talks about disability file reviews. So this could be where you had a patient that was filing for disability and the insurance company did not allow the disability claim and it goes up for review. They very frequently use an outside independent doctor to make the determination, was this patient really disabled or not? Um, but this could also cover any other insurance file reviews. So maybe you have a patient that's looking at some experimental treatment and their medical insurance didn't cover it. They might appeal and once again, that might go to an independent physician to be able to make that determination. So by the case, these can run 50 to $100. Um, many of these cases take maybe five minutes, some of them as little as 20 minutes. And by the hour, this might come up to $100, $200, or even more. So one of the great things about our very beloved clients is many of our clients who are doing side gigs have offered to let me interview them. And I've been recording these interviews because they've got lots and lots of information for our doctors who are thinking about getting into these kinds of side gigs. And one of the interviews I did is with Dr. Tina Rizak who is um, an oncologist, HEMOC. And it was so fun to talk to her because she has a couple of different uh, side gigs and doing file reviews is one of them. And she talks a little bit about how she got into that business, how, uh, what it's like and how she got more efficient over time. And in this interview, she also said that it really helped her be better at her main gig, being an on oncologist because she learned so much by doing this and looking at other files and she felt she actually did a better job with her patients. Things that she had learned doing this review. So one of the things to think about, reviewing files. Uh, next is consulting. Once again, the hourly rate can be all over the ballpark. T typically the older you are, the longer you've been practicing medicine and the more expert you are, obviously the higher the fees you can be. It's not unusual to see doctors making $500 an hour uh, doing consulting. And once again, we have a number of clients doing consulting. They might make 50 to 100,000 a year just from their consulting income. One of the things I should have mentioned was all of these side gigs that we're talking about today do not involve patient work with the exception of one. So none of these will you actually be the physician for a patient and therefore you won't need medical malpractice insurance for the things that we're talking about today. All right, next on the list is we have writing. Very often, whether it's a, maybe it's a TV program, it could be a pharmaceutical company, it could be um, all sorts of other businesses, they need a physician to actually write writing, uh, write writing. <laughs> they need the physician to be writing articles or, or maybe reviewing their advertising materials. And once again, the pay here is all over the ballpark. Uh, some of our clients are probably in the twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year just doing writing for various different companies. Now, telemed. Obviously, this is new, not news to anybody in our audience. Um, telemed has gotten so popular. I did two interviews with doctors who are doing telemedicine, and this has been awesome for some of the, for some of these doctors. You can make maybe between one thousand and two thousand a shift in an eight-hour shift. And one of the doctors I interviewed, Dr. Michael Blackburn, was describing how he got involved with telemedicine and how great it was during COVID because they shortened the whole credentialing period. So where it may in the past have taken months to get properly credentialed so you could do telemedicine, they were able to speed through that just in a matter of a few weeks to get up and running. And one of the companies that he works for is like Uber. So, you know, if it's it's like maybe eight or nine o'clock at night, the kids are in bed, he's got an hour or two, he can just open up his app and say, I'm here, I'm ready to take patients if there's, any, if there's anybody there. I thought that was really awesome. So tel telemed, 
In these cases, yes, of course, you're going to need medical malpractice insurance, but the telemed companies that you work with are going to be providing that for you. And then expert witness. Now, one of our most popular videos, I interviewed pediatrician, awesome doctor, Dr. Brian Alverson, and he was so generous and so kind. He actually describes how much money he makes being an expert witness and how he got into the expert witness business. And he started out charging about 300 or maybe 350 per hour. And he, he just kept ratcheting it up and ratcheting it up and ratcheting it up to a much higher rate. And 750 an hour is not unusual for expert witnessing. Um, I actually know of other doctors who might be getting as much as $1,000 an hour for being an expert witness. So keep in mind, you don't actually have to just bill the time that you're in court. You can build time up front when you're pre prepping for a case and reviewing it. You can also build time if you're doing depositions. So all of that adds together. And I really loved Brian's approach to this business. He said some doctors just feel horrible about testifying against other doctors. And he said, the good news for him is they may call him to do it in Ohio. He doesn't care. He's never going to see these people again. He doesn't care if they beat him up on the, on the witness stand because he's the expert. It's whatever he says goes. And I love his approach. He also reviews every case up front. And if he doesn't think there's malpractice there, he tells them up front. They, he still charges them a fee for reviewing that file. And that way he can be doing that practice in line with his own ethics and things that he feels morally okay about. So don't give up the idea of expert witnessing. It can be very, very lucrative. Now, Josh, before I talk about our new course, is there anything you want to add to any of these side gigs that we've seen clients do? The one thing I've had, I would add that I've seen a lot of clients do more recently is related to the telemedicine. So a, a lot of you have been doing telemed and you're getting more and more comfortable with it uh, just because COVID has forced that in a lot of ways. But we're seeing clients that are licensing in multiple states to increase the pool of people that they can serve. And so that way they can hop on, you know, telemed like that Uber-like app and be serving a, a larger population uh, so that way that they're they're always in front of a patient. Yeah, I think that's really important. Obviously, the more states you can get credentialed in, the more lucrative this can be, the more options that you have. Um, I'm seeing a lot of telemedicine with, uh, with psychiatrists. In fact, we have one doctor recently, she just quit her job um, and st started to do telemedicine from home. And it's not like the old days now where she'd have to go out and rent an office and she'd have to have a reception and all of this. She can do this from home. Her costs are really, really, really inexpensive. So another thing to think about there. And I'm seeing more emergency med docs get into telemedicine too, and among other professions. Now, we have had so much interest in doctors and side gigs that Josh and I are launching a special course in January. And it's going to have maybe 10 to 15 different videos, including these videos I've been talking about where we interview different doctors. It's going to have PDFs. It's going to have our very special uh, business plan for side gigs. And it's going to be an online course, totally complimentary for our clients. I'm really, really, really excited about it. It's launching in January uh, 2021. And if you're at all interested in this, please just reach out to us. Once again, info at MD Financial Advisors, and we will uh, get back to you when we have a little more details about it. So I'm hoping that's going to be really, really helpful to everyone. All right. Now let's talk about how to get started. This is the big thing. I constantly have doctors say to me, I need to do a side gig. I need to do a side gig, but I don't know how to get started. Do you ever hear that, Josh? Yeah, I, I hear it a lot. And, you know, part of it is it seems rather complex when in fact, you know, once you know where to go, it can really be simplified. Right. And that's part of what we're trying to do is a, take away the fear and B, give you a roadmap on how you can do this for yourself. Uh, so believe it or not, the first step is talk to colleagues. One of the things you'll see in all these interviews we did is almost all of them had a colleague that got them into whatever their sidekick was. It was maybe it had been their mentor, it may have been another peer, but sometimes they got a case and they couldn't handle it, so they put it onto one of their colleagues. Or they just say, this is such a good gig, you, you need to do it too. So this is the very first place I would start. 
Just survey your colleagues, find out what are they doing, what do they like, what don't they like, what kind of suggestions do they have? And very often that may be all you need to, for you to get linked up to your perfect site. Now, another thing you can do, once again, this depends on what side gig you're thinking about, but certain side gigs have registries. So for instance, there is expert witness directories. There's a company called Seek, we're gonna be talking about them in just a minute. They do a lot of training for doctors and side gigs. And you can get on their directory, I think it's only about $545 per year. And they, the last time I heard, they told me they send this out to like every attorney's office in the country that does litigation. Now, my own law firm, many of our clients know that I'm an attorney. My own law firm uses a company called Tazanet, and they have a registry for expert witnesses. So these are just two of the places that you can go to if you want to get on a registry. Now, next step might be training. So I mentioned Seek before. So Seek is a very interesting company, started 30, 40 years ago by an attorney in Cape Cod, um, Massachusetts. And their entire thing is they train doctors for what they call supplemental or non-clinical income. And they have numerous different training programs. Uh, they train them how to be expert witnesses. They train them on how to do file reviews. They tra train them on how to do insurance exams and really help you get started in, the, in this business. Interestingly enough, their training seems to be very inexpensive for me. A lot of these seminars are only $1,000 to $2,000. So this is a great place to take a look at, look at their website. Their owner, a wonderful person, Steve Babinski, I actually um, interviewed him too. So he's gonna be on our a big class that we're launching in January. And he's very, very helpful. Sometimes doctors just call him and say, this is my background. What kind of suggestions do you have for me uh, for side gigs? It's very, very knowledgeable. And then, of course, we'd really like you to talk to us. So our clients have been just so generous that very often you'll see in these videos, they will say, reach out to me. So we give you their work e email address. And if you've got questions, they've been very happy to answer those questions. So we can very often kind of link you up to other colleagues in the field that might be able to help whatever it is that you're thinking about. And of course, we're launching this, actually this quarter, our very, I want to call it famous, but it's not quite famous yet, but our very special business plan for doctors and side gigs, which I'll be talking about a little bit more in a minute, and showing you how it works. And then another thing that we like to do for our side gig clients is to coordinate with other professionals, because you're likely going to need some help from accountants, or attorneys, and we like to be able to coordinate that for you to keep it nice and easy for you. All right, Alyssa, I hope we have some questions. We do. So this one is, any tips for side gigs outside of medicine? Tips for side gigs outside of medicine. Josh, what would you say there? Well, I, I think the first thing is, you you know, I'd encourage you to talk to us about evaluating your time and figuring out what your time's worth. So, you know, we should do some math and, and figure out what is your hourly rate? What's your hourly after tax rate? Um, and you might be interested in a passion project that doesn't pay you a lot of money, but more commonly someone is interested in something that's going to pay them very, a very similar amount. And you know, because as physicians and dentists, you guys are paid so much, it's going to narrow the options, that the opportunities you have uh, for doing something outside of medicine. Um, sometimes the question comes up, you know, is there something you can do, you know, besides selling your time, which is effectively what you're doing? And, you know, we'd encourage you to think about what are things there that are related to medicine? So whether it's medical device or, you know, consulting on medical device or something that might pay you some kind of uh, ongoing revenue, ongoing income later on in the future, sometimes that's a, an interest for someone that's um, not as interested in something that's front and center medicine or, or clinical uh, opportunities. Well, I've got a couple stories that might answer this question. And I would say everything that Josh is, I certainly agree with everything Josh is saying, but think about what is your passion. So one of my interviews, it was so fun. 
It was with Dr. Sonia Wright. She's a pediatric radiologist. And her passion project is sex education. As she, as she points out, who doesn't like to talk about sex? So she actually went to uh, Michigan and got a special training in, the, in this. And then she's taken a number of classes about how to be a coach. And she's created a whole group of online classes where she focuses on midlife women and some of the sexual issues that they're facing. And it's just a blast to talk to her because you could see that how much she loved being a radiologist. It was getting kind of tiring for her, I think it's fair to say, but she's got so charged up for doing this passion project that really doesn't have anything to do with practicing medicine at all, um, that she's actually enjoying her day job as a radiologist a lot more. So I would say find your passion and see if you can find something along those lines that really appeals to you. Um, we had another case recently with a client who did medicine for a while then got into administration. And I think she was, at, she was really, really brilliant at taxes for some reason. Of course, she really loved our approach with our tax efficient investing. And she's in a place where she's switching careers right now. And she called me and said, I'm thinking about opening up a tax practice. And, and we talked it through. I thought, great idea. I've got lots and lots of clients we could send you because every doctor needs an, account an accountant. So those are some of the things that we've seen that other doctors do. Um, Alyssa, do we have any other questions? No, that is all so far. Okay, okay great. Now, the fun part, what to do with the extra money? So to me, the most difficult case, and we have had a couple of these, where the doctor whose income is so down due to COVID that they're not able to pay living expenses. And in that situation, we want to be able to use this extra income, obviously, just to get you up to ground zero, so you're not running in the hole every month, so you're not putting things on the credit card that you can't pay, pay off. So I would have you say, promise yourself, though, that this is just a short-term solution. And that once your salary returns back to normal, and I do believe it will, that you're going to use this extra money for building wealth and not just for keeping, for keeping even. All right. The next thing you can do is pay down debt. I'm really glad we've got Josh here today because he is like my absolute debt specialist. And so why don't you share with us some thoughts about this, Josh? Yeah. So the most common things we see, especially with something that happens that's more short term, is is there's some extra credit card. Maybe your income was impacted uh, during COVID-19. So we can look at restructuring the credit cards. A lot of doctors are unaware that there's special loan programs available just for you that have a reasonable interest rate, but it allows you to consolidate that high interest credit card debt and then pay it off over a longer period of time, which you certainly could prepay as well. So those kind of strategies can save doctors in the thousands when you factor in the interest rate savings. So that comes up. Student loans are another biggie. A lot of you are not paying on your student loans right now because we've got the breaks until the end of the year where it's 0% on the federal loans. Um, and it counts for public service loan forgiveness for those that are doing that. Uh, but we also look at other things for, you know, non-federal loans or, or loans you don't intend to leave federal. Maybe we want to look at refinancing. So we, we think it's really valuable for all of our clients to have a debt plan. And so if you're curious about, if you're one of our existing clients and you're curious about your debts, are you getting the best interest rates? You know, certainly reach out to us. Another common one right now is mortgage refinancing. Um, if you're, you're someone new to us, you know, reach out and, and learn how we might be able to help you with your debts. A lot of times we can save a, a good chunk of change related to liabilities. And one of the things I love about what you do, Josh, with these debt plans is we look at those clients that are in public service loan forgiveness and does it make sense for them to stay there? Are they better off refinancing and getting out of it? And that, that offers them a lot of freedom because very often I think doctors feel stuck at a particular institution because they think they can get the uh, PSLF treatment, when maybe it might actually be cheaper, better, more freeing for them to refinance the debt and, and pay it all off at a lower rate. All right, let's run through some case studies and see what the impact is. So let's take a 50-year-old orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. B, who is recently divorced. And Dr. B starts doing expert witnessing. Once again, I said it's not unusual for orthopedic surgeons, particularly all older, 50 and above, to be making $1,000 an hour doing expert witnessing. We're going to assume he, he's going to do it 10 hours a month. So that's going to bring in a gross of 10000 a month. But 
Of course, he's got taxes on that. So after taxes, it's only going to be about 6,500. Now, the question is, if he does this for 15 years, up to age 65, how much additional wealth would this be? And what's awesome about this is if he saved that every month for 15 years, before taxes, he'd have about 2.1 million. After he pays the capital gains tax, he has close to 2 million more dollars. So it's pretty substantial. Now, question, that extra $2 million, how long do you think that's gonna last Dr. B in retirement? So let's assume that Dr. B starts taking withdrawals at 5% when he turns 65, and then he increases them 3% each year just to cover inflation. So what we find is the first month that he's retired, that 5%, Withdrawal starts at 67.24 per month. And then every year, as we said, he's gonna increase that by about 3% to keep up with inflation. So if we assume we're only getting a 6% return on money, the question we have is how long will this investment last? And much to my surprise, when I ran the math, I actually found that it would last until age 94. So once again, just a little extra time per month can have a huge impact on a much nicer retirement. Okay, let's talk about case study number three. We've got 40 year old doctor who's got eight year old twins. They have not saved a dime for these twins college. So this doctor couple says, let's do side gigs between the two of us. We're gonna make sure it's 500 an hour. We're gonna do 14 hours a month and we're gonna put everything we make towards our twins college savings. What does that look like? So. On a monthly basis, gross, that comes to about 7,000 after taxes, about 4,500. So what if they invested all of this for 10 years? The question is, how much will they have for the twins' education? And shockingly, it comes to close to $800,000, which I consider a very nice, lovely nest egg. And in my hypothetical example, we sent the the twins to Brown, because we have a lot of doctors who uh, are affiliated with Brown Medical School, so we use this for our example. And we, the question I had, is this enough to cover college, or will they have any money left over? And sure enough, with our 790000 we found that tuition for two boys, four years at a very expensive private school was going to come to about 741000 They will have almost 50000 left over. Woohoo! I say mom and dad can add that to their retirement account, take a big trip, um, and maybe even retire early on that. All right, case study number four. What if you took some of your additional side gig income and put it into a brokerage account? So let's just say that you've been saving 2000 a month. Good on you. We, the question is, how much more will we have in your brokerage account in 25 years? So 2,000 a month by itself does end up to being about 1.7 million in 25 years. But if we can put 4,000 in, for, I should say 4,000 extra for a total of 6,000, wow, we'd actually have 5.2 million or an additional $3.5 million just by an extra $4,000 per month. So Josh, your thoughts before we recap. Yeah, I think one of the highlights that Catherine's sharing there is this value, this miracle of compound interest. And so tiny differences that you make early in your career have huge, huge impacts later on, whether it's paying for school for kiddos or whether it's retirement or leaving a legacy even. Um, so that's a huge thing. The other thing I thought of as we're, we're going through this, it's not uncommon for us to have doctors that make more on an hourly basis on the side gig than their day job. And so you want to be mindful of that too. And, and maybe you're able to make more, maybe it's more lucrative um, to do the side gig. Right. That was a big surprise to me. And we're going to actually have a case study about that that's coming up in just a minute. So to recap, Here's the steps. First, look at spending. Maybe all, just getting a handle on your spending might be enough to get you the extra income that you want. Um, if not, we go to step two. Let's look at some options for side gigs. And we also talked about how you can get started and then what some of the things you can think about doing with the funds, like I said, the very fun part. 
All right, the next thing we wanna cover is some tax advantage solutions for the new funds. This is a big, big part of why side gigs are so attractive for doctors. Some tax deductions. I also wanna hit on some of the key mistakes we see doctors making with their side gig income, how we can pull it all together with the MD Financial Side Gig Business Plan and some next steps for you to consider. So let's start with tax advantage solutions for these new funds. So Josh, this is an area that you really, really excel in. Why don't you just talk us through this? Yeah, so when you have a side gig, often it's paid 1099 as an independent contractor. As a result, you're allowed to do different retirement plans than what you're likely accustomed to as a W-2 employee somewhere. So where you're accustomed to doing like a 401k or 403b or something like that at work, now you have more options. And the most common option that we suggest is called a solo 401k. It still allows you to do a backdoor Roth IRA, and it allows you to put aside money on a tax advantage basis. Some of it can be Roth solo 401k, some of it can be pre-tax solo 401k, so we have options. In addition, it comes with a special feature, which is the profit sharing component. This is what allows you to fund the account even above what you're saving through work. So you might be running into savings at work where you put aside 19,500 or 26,000 a year. This is something that lets you save beyond that. And then lastly, we have the more complex plan, which is called a cash balance plan. And inside a cash balance plan can live a 401 age much more complex, much, you know, on a future date, we'll go through it in more detail. But for those that are making a lot more on their side gig, you should definitely talk to us about this. The money's tax deferred, and then the 401H part can be used for healthcare, and it's tax-free like a supersized HSA, where it's tax-free on the front end and the back end. A lot of people don't know about these plans, and they're huge, hugely beneficial. Awesome. So I think in the future, Josh, we should definitely do a, a class just on these retirement vehicles and go into more detail, particularly the cash balance and 401H, because for the right client, it can be a huge, huge savings. And keep in mind that when you uh, have a side gig, you are both the employee and the employer. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, as Josh mentioned, you can actually set aside more money very often from your side gig income than you could in your day job. Now, let's see how this plays out. So your solo 401k, uh, when you're the employee, we wanna make sure that you coordinate this with your W-2 income or your contributions that you're making at your day job. So Josh, explain to us why that's important. Yeah, so it's important because the IRS establishes a contribution limit that's gonna incorporate that 403b or 401k that you're contributing to, contributing to at work in a W-2 situation. So those contribution limits are going to be 19,500 if you're under 50 or 26,000. And we don't want to overfund it because then the IRS is going to penalize you. Right, exactly. So we have to make sure that we get this coordinated. To Josh's point, we don't want to be overfunding these. So very typically, we will very carefully look at what you're contributing at work and uh, oftentimes work with your accountant too to make sure that we can do that and maximize it. Now, one of the reasons these are excellent plans, and whenever possible, I like to set these up for our clients, is that this 401k from the employee standpoint could either be pre-tax or tax-free or Roth contributions. And so we still see some doctors who don't have a Roth option at work, and so they have so little options of getting money into that tax-free bucket. This can be a great way to get some money into tax-free because we can have a solo Roth 401k. Now, the profit sharing part. Josh, explain to us how this works. This is great. So the profit sharing is always calculated the year after. So if we were doing this in 2020, we're doing this calculation around tax season with your tax accountant. And it's about 25% of your net income. Meaning if you made 100 grand of net income, then you know we can set aside 25,000 of that net income. And the, it, your net income is what you made as a 1099 contractor minus your deductions. And we'll go through some deductions here in a moment. The fantastic thing about this is if you make enough in the side gig, you can actually contribute 37500 And that's above 
what you're doing in your day job, that 19,500. So it allows for a tax deferred contribution that's gonna save you on taxes and allow way more tax advantage savings than what you typically had. So this is another great way to get your taxes down now. Uh, and, but once again, we have to coordinate this with your day job because your employer is very likely giving you a match and that match you're getting from your day job plus what you're putting into this account cannot go above 37,500 this year. And all, also this is 99 times out of 100, maybe even 999 times out of 1,000, this is all going to be pre-tax money. Very rarely are these plans set up to do uh, to do what we call mega backdoor Roth. But that is something we can do. And Josh, I think we should put that on our list to be talking about when we go into these in more detail, because that's a fun way to get more money in the tax-free bucket. All right, let's see how this would play out in our case study number five. So we're going to assume that we do with that solo 401k, which is the most common of these plans. Uh, there's SEP IRAs, there's other things that we could do, but we really think this, the solo 401k is the, is the most advantageous usually. And let's assume we get 100,000 from our side gig. So in our hypothetical example here, we're gonna assume our doctor is under 50, can only contribute 19,500. And at their day job, they're contributing the max there. So that comes out to 19,500. But we've got a solo 401k. And remember, we had 100,000 here after taxes. So Josh, step us through how we can get that extra 25% here into our retirement plans. Yeah, so we're assuming that, you know, you got 100,000 of 1099 income after the deduction. So they might have even made a little bit more. They, they did some deductions, there was 100. We take 25% of that number, we coordinate with your tax accountant and we come up with that. And that's a write-off. So now you're saving, you're, you're taxed on less income. And so this is a huge, huge advantage for many doctors because they're at that high tax break bracket and they were, let's say, saving in accounts that didn't give them any kind of tax benefits. Now they threw this into the mix and they're getting some major, major tax deferral along with saving taxes today. So in this, in our hypothetical example here, by adding that extra 25,000, now we're putting 44,500 into retirement accounts, tax advantage, that saves about 15,575 or an additional 8,700 and change just by having this extra account. All right, now another thing we can do is backdoor Roth IRAs. Maybe you're going, no, I don't wanna make 50,000, I don't wanna make 100,000 from this. Maybe you just want enough to do something simple like do your backdoor Roth IRA. So let's say you're 50 years old today and you want to do this for 15 years. You have your side gig income, you set aside 7,000 a year. At, at, we're getting 8% at age 59. I'm sorry, and remember it's tax-free after age 59 and a half. Guess what? You've got $190,000 tax-free by the time you turn 65. For a lot of our clients, that's an entire year's worth of income in retirement, all tax-free. So even doing something as little as 7,000 a year can have a big impact. All right, um, shall I pause for questions, Alyssa, before I go to tax deductions? Yeah, I had one question come in, and how much does it cost typically to set up um, an S-Corp, an LLC? Right. Oh, great question. Uh, the, the numbers on this can vary depending upon what part of the country you're in, whether you're using an attorney or not. So I've seen it maybe as low as $350, $500, maybe up to a thousand or more, depending upon how much work the attorney is doing, how experienced they are and so forth. But that's a really, really great question. And some of our clients may not need a, um, an LLC. Some of them may prefer to do an S corp or even a C corp, or some of them may want to talk about doing the most simple thing, which is just putting this on your schedule C. So typically the more money that you're going to be making, the more complex business entity that you're going to need. And then the more help you might need from an attorney to help set that up. Great question. All right, moving on to tax deductions. We always love tax deductions. How can we pay uncle Sam a little less? So home office expenses, this is something that many of our doctors have been forgetting 
as they are doing their side gigs. And here's how this home office deduction works. So let's assume uh, that uh, you've got an um, office in your apartment or your home, and it's 10% of the total square footage of your entire home. And you're using this as your dedicated office for your side gig, your, bus your business. Well, guess what? You can deduct 10% then of a whole bunch of different things that you are already paying for. Let me give you just some of the examples. You can deduct 10% of your utilities. You can deduct 10% of your rent or your mortgage. You can deduct 10% for repairs. You can deduct 10% for phone, internet expenses, household cleaners, your lawn service, new appliances. So one of the things we did when we recorded some of our mini interviews is I actually recorded my own accountant. And you'll probably laugh when you listen to this recording because I was just complaining to him that I had to put in not one, but two water heaters into my house. And he explains to me how I'm gonna be able to deduct part of that expense as a business expense. And I thought, oh, I love you. That was awesome. It was really good to know. So I hope you get a lot out of that, out of that recording. You can also deduct internet security, lots of other things there that could go on this list. So let me just show you how this could work out. So if your current mortgage, let's just say is 3,500, but your cleaners, utilities, internet, whatever, totals up about 4,600. So that's a total de uh, deduction of about $460, total tax deduction on a monthly basis. Now that ends up, if we do $460 a month over 12 months, that's actually a tax deduction of over $5,500 per year, meaning $5,500 or so of things that you're already paying for that now you don't have to pay tax on. So please do, please take a look at this because this can make a big, big difference in your taxes. Now there are other expenses you can deduct, startup expenses, education training, you know, if you decided to put your name in on one of these registries and they charged you, you can certainly deduct all of those and many, many other things including business meals, although these are only 50% deductible, but you can deduct work-related travel, work-related car use, advertising, promotions. Now, one of the things my accountant said to me early on was, Catherine, you never take any trips that don't have a business comp component. So um, I love going to Arizona in the winter when it gets really cold in Minnesota. I wanna make sure that when I'm going down there, I'm visiting with every client that we've got there. So at least I'm able to deduct some of my uh, travel expenses to do that. And plus, I just love seeing them because it's really fun. Now, any other questions, Alyssa? Yeah, one quick one. So we talked a lot about how side gigs can provide a lot of extra money. Um, is there a reason why someone would want to pay down a lot of their debt as opposed to put a lot of money into these retirement accounts? Yes, I think that's entirely possible. But once again, let's do that in a thoughtful manner. So if we've got clients who've got student debts at maybe 2%, 3%, whatever, I, I probably would not recommend that unless they can't sleep at night, unless they, can, you know, they need to pay that debt off. And the reason is, if we've got debt at say 2 or 3%, but we couldn't be investing it and making maybe 6 or 7%, you can see that difference of three or 4% or more per year uh, over time has a huge impact on their bottom line. And Josh, I wanna let you uh, throw in some comments here because this is really your area of expertise. Absolutely. And the other thing is I'd encourage you to chat with us about that because there's more nuances. It might depend on the time period of the debt. It might depend on how much risk you're willing to take in the market, that's gonna determine how much rates of return we're gonna have up and above the cost of that debt. But be really mindful that right now, interest rates are at historical lows. The student loan should be really low. The mortgage interest rates should be extremely low. Car deals are going great. So th there's a lot of reason to maybe not accelerate paying off those debts, especially for younger doctors. Yeah, I like that, especially for younger doctors, because on the other hand, if you're in your, like, your late 60s and you're getting ready to retire in a couple years, then for sure, we'd want to get as much of these debts paid off as possible. So I agree with Josh. It's, very, it's nuanced and something we should probably talk about. All right. I've, 
This is my favorite area though, is mistakes doctors make with side gigs and how, how to avoid them. All right, mistake number one, not setting aside any funds for taxes. Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you the doctors who told me how much money they made on the side gigs and they're like, oh my gosh, tax time came. And I'm thinking, well, what the heck? You know, of course, they weren't withholding any money on any of your side gig income. It all came directly to you. So what is the solution? Set up a separate savings account and put 35% off the top. Every check you get, just stuck, stick it away and pretend it's not your money because it's not your money. It's Uncle Sam's money. And then when it comes to tax time, great, you're gonna have a nice checking your savings account there ready to pay the taxes and it won't feel very painful. So don't spend that money that's not yours. Number two, not getting advice on the proper business entities. So we talked about this just a minute before, but one of the things we like to do is talk through with you the different options and see what's best for you. If you're just getting your feet wet and side gigs and you don't think you're gonna be making that much money between now and the end of the year, like I said, it may be fine just to do this Schedule C. We don't need any particular business entity. You can still do all these deductions that we've been talking about. On the other hand, as your income is going up and up with this, you wanna make sure you're protected and you might wanna need an S Corp or a C Corp or a limited liability corporation, depending upon what's appropriate. So a lot of times we will work with your accountant and come together with a particular plan that works best for you and your situation. All right, mistake number three, not taking any deductions or losses against the income. We mentioned that before, we talked about that home office example and what's interesting about that is if you're making just 50,000 a year after tax and you're bringing in about 32,500 with this tax deduction it actually just doing that home office, the one example we had before, saves you $3,500. I consider that a lot of money and maybe it's a nice vacation. Now, mistake number four, not having a business plan. So Josh, let's talk about what you've seen with doctors doing their side gigs and not having a business plan. Yeah, so as far as not having a plan, it's really hard to evaluate, you know, what kind of tax savings you're gonna get, whether it's worth your time. So some of the things we wanna incorporate in that plan is, what is your hourly rate? What would be that hourly rate if you did the side gig? Sometimes it's more, especially when we account for the tax differences. And so that helps you evaluate, is this something worth pursuing? How many tax deductions do you expect to actually get from this? Uh, so it, it's really helpful in knowing how valuable is this to you financially? And that's a key part of the plan. And, and we all know the more we put, you know, our plans on paper, the more likely it's actually going to happen too. Absolutely. It really lets you know, is it worth the sacrifice to do this? So some of the things that we cover, I'm just hitting the highlights today. It's actually more complicated than this. Is we like to run through, our, we've got an entire worksheet. We'll talk about first steps. We'll help you go through what are the costs so you can be thinking about this. To Josh's point, we can calculate what is your hourly rate and does it make sense to coordinate with a retirement plan? What are tax advantage savings can we, can we look at as potentials here? And then we wanna pull it all, to get all together. So in our example today, let's run through a case study and show how we can pull it together, all the things that we've been talking about along with this business plan that we'd love to do for our clients. So once again, very typical situation, case study, Dr. X, is a hospitalist, works for a hospital, obviously, makes about 300,000 a year, and he's 30 years for retirement. So Dr. X has got an interesting dilemma. He could do extra shifts and just work at the hospital, make $61,600, or he's got a side gig opportunity, also with the exact same amount coming in, just so we can compare it apples to apples. We assumed his side gig was gonna make him 61,600. How did we come to this? Well, Dr. X decides he wants to do insurance file reviews. He really likes that work. He thinks it keeps him sharp. And he figures he can do it about 48, hour, uh, 48 weeks a year. He thinks he can do seven hours a week 
and he's anticipating making $200 an hour. So this is how we came up with the $61,600. Now, he's got some tax deductions. One time startup cost of about $2,600, that home office deduction we talked about, about $888. Other uh, deductions, getting started, uh, up, startup expenses and so forth. So his total deductions before putting any contributions into his retirement plan are about $9,700. Now, at work at the hospital, Dr. X is already maximizing his 403B. He's putting in 19,500. So although we can use a solo 401k, we cannot use it for the employee portion. We can only use it for the profit sharing or employer portion. But in this example, we figured that he could set aside an additional $12,975. So that's what he can increase his retirement contributions by. So if we take the taxes out and we subtract out the retirement contributions, when all that's subtracted out, he's still left with almost $37,000. Here's the part that I find so interesting on this, because remember he's comparing, shall I continue to work as a hospitalist and put in some extra shifts, or shall I do a side gig income? Look at his tax bite on this new income. It's only 19% compared to the tax bite that he'd have on his extra shifts would be 35%. So in this scenario, he's actually able to keep more money even though the top line revenue is exactly the same. So what happens if he's saving more for, for retirement? Let's just say that he, out of this money, he takes $12,975 a year, he puts in the profit sharing part of his 401k and the rest of this money, woohoo, almost 37,000, he pays down debt and he travels because he loves to travel and he just uses it for fun. So the question is, what is this, I'm gonna call it 13,000. This 13,000 a year extra, what does it do for him? Well, in 30 years, it actually gives Dr. X an additional $1.2 million for retirement. And that's assuming I consider a fairly conservative growth rate of about only six and a half percent. Josh, do you want to make some comments before I go on to our next slide? I think it just illustrates, again, these tiny differences have huge lasting impacts. You know, Dr. X can do considerably more for retirement along with having that extra money for fun, for the debts, for the college, for whatever it might be. I mean, this might solve a lot of, you know, problems because we all know that you know, you have a certain amount of fixed expenses that you have to pay, but then if you have just a little bit of extra money, that can be all the difference in the world because you've already covered your fixed expenses with the income you're making in your day job. Here's all the extra stuff. Great way to think about it. It's like the play money. All right, let's talk about next steps, things you can th be thinking about. Obviously, we'll be talking a little bit more about calling us. We'll talk about putting together a business plan and talking to your colleagues. So when we're working with doctors, as I said, we're gonna start with the budget. Can, can we find any find, found money, any lost money that's hiding there? Setting up your future goals. We're gonna to wanna to look at the tax advantages and some saving strategies, and then obviously creating your own individual side gig business plan. So you have a really clear picture of what this is going to do for you. And some of the things we'll be talking about, as we mentioned before, the worksheets, some of the costs, calculating your hourly rate, and setting up tax advantage savings plans, all the while coordinating it with any retirement plans you have at work. Step two, time to talk to your colleagues. Reach out to those colleagues. Like I said, they've been so generous. I don't know another profession that would be so open about how they're making extra money and kind of bringing you into the fold and helping you make extra money too. Uh, Trust me, that would not be happening uh, with the lawyers I know. So find out what's working for them. Ask who are they working for? What doesn't work? What kind of mistakes did they make? Maybe they'd be willing to make some um, introductions for you. Get whatever you can out of those relationships. And a lot of times too, your colleagues are gonna share with you how they got started and actually do some little tra some training for this to make it easier for you. And then as I mentioned before, we're doing our side gig starter course. We're gonna be launching it in January. Lots of videos, PDFs, 
It will also include uh, a, a business plan for each of our clients. Once again, totally complimentary for our clients. We just want to help them get to the next level. So if you're not a client and you're listening to this, you can uh, get some more information about this. Reach out to us at info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. If you are a client, just reach out and let us know that you want to be on the list for this. We'd be happy to include you. All right. So Alyssa, last questions. So the only question we had was about cost, but it seems like you just answered that. So I think we should be good for now. Okay. All right, so let me go through some my final thoughts, but before we get to my final thoughts, I want to have Josh share his final thoughts. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest takeaways from all this is it is, it's rather simple. And so don't let the, what it seems like can be complex, prohibit you from, from doing this because an extra 20 grand or 30 grand you can mentally earmark as whatever is important to you as that goal. And this can make a huge, huge difference uh, over a long period of time. Tiny differences have huge lasting impacts when it comes to finances. Absolutely. So remember our goal in our philosophy is when you take charge of your finances, you can actually transform your life. And so I have a couple things. To Josh's point, don't be afraid of side gigs. A lot of doctors that are kind of nervous about this, absolutely not. Keep in, also in mind that finding the right one can be trial and error. So I would suggest that maybe you consider trying two or three, and maybe one or two of these aren't gonna be a good fit for you, and another one is gonna be a great fit, it's gonna be easy for you, it's gonna be uplifting, something you're gonna really get refreshed doing and make some extra money on the side. Now, one of the things we haven't talked much about, but I think it's important going forward, medicine is changing. And for most of our clients, it's not changing in a way that they are happy with. Uh, it's getting more burdensome in many ways, and more and more of our doctors are facing burnout, as you saw from our um, original poll that we took. So I think it's important for doctors to diversify your sources of income, because you don't know what's going to happen to medicine in the future. So just the way we diversify your investments, we think you should also diversify your income because it's a great protection strategy for you if the bottom falls out of medicine. You've got something else that can help you. And to Josh's point, a few extra hours per month can have a big impact, not just today, but in your future down the road. All right, so I've got our contact information here if you wanna reach out to us. I know you know our email address by now. It's info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. It has been wonderful to visit with you today, and I look forward to helping each of you with your own side gig. So looking forward to chatting with you in person. Take care. And thanks, Josh. Appreciate your help. And Alyssa, you are awesome as usual. Take care. Bye, guys.